Good afternoon. My name is Doug Root. I'm the Vice President of Communications and External Affairs at the Pittsburgh Foundation, and I'm a board member of Media Impact Funders. I'm honored for two reasons to introduce the next program. Most of us involved in supporting journalism, documentaries, and other forms of storytelling have been consumed with fixing the crisis of broken structures and process. But as a community foundation person, I see the need every day for reframing, recasting, and refreshing storytelling that provides the best version of the truth for community residents. This segment continues the afternoon theme of expanding our thinking about support to include the shape and design of the storytelling itself, the narrative. The second reason I'm honored is that I get to introduce the best person I can think of to moderate this program, Grant Oliphant, my longtime colleague, guide, and co-conspirator in establishing the value of strategic communications. Anytime we on the uh, Media Impact Funders Board land a foundation president and CEO at one of these forums, we're absolutely thrilled because there's leadership networking and vision all in one person. Well, usually. Um, but with Grant, it's a certainty. He heads the Conrad Pre Prebis Foundation in San Diego, and he has previous CEO positions at the Heinz Endowments and the Pittsburgh Foundation. He has chaired the boards of National Foundation Affinity Groups and partnered with international foundations. But I know for sure that the work he loves most is leading place-based philanthropy. Impressive as his CEO credentials are, they don't qualify him to lead this session as much as what he learned from the job he had at the beginning of his career in foundations, communications officer. Grant is an accomplished writer, a talented podcaster, and a keen messaging strategist. But you'll see that for yourself in the session that comes up. So Grant will come in and he'll take his usual position at the drums and um, he'll introduce the session and the panelists. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So that was embarrassing. Um, I, I've been feeling a certain way this, this uh, well, today. Um, just being in a room full of people who, my heart is, is in this room. You know, I, I have um, been privileged, as Doug said, to have a couple of uh, leadership positions, but the work all along has been about how we change hearts and minds and behavior and attitudes. And to see a room this full is amazing. And I was thinking, you know, when I started in this work, um, which was a few days ago, um, I, I, it was kind of a poetic idea that you had to change narratives because, you know, people, people see the world the way they expect to see the world. And, we, you know, we would quote poetry to talk about that. And there's great poetry about it, by the way. But there, um, now there's also neuroscience. And it's like not just a poetic idea. People literally see the world that they expect to see. And so the conversation that we're having to, uh, today here in this um, conference and now in this panel is really about why that matters so much and how we can help us see a different world than the one we expect to see or people being, are being led to believe that they have to see. So I'm just really honored to share this platform with uh, Marisol and Mark who are I've gotten to know them uh, recently through this process, and they're amazing people. Um, and we're gonna dive right into the question of narrative, and then we'll get to the organizational stuff and what you do. And, but let's start with uh, the narratives around housing and homelessness, and how, they're, how you're experiencing them to be broken, and how you see the challenge of dealing with that. Super. Marisol, yeah. All right, thank you, Grant, and thank yeah. you, everyone. I'm so excited to, to be here, and I'm gonna try not to nerd out on the whole cognitive Do. science, because yeah, that's my jam. Um, but, but the narrative in homelessness and housing security, so 
to start off, right, this country was built on a narrative that poverty, if you are suffering po from poverty, you, are, you have a moral failing, right? So personal responsibility. So it's really no surprise, or should be no surprise to anyone, that homelessness is an extension. The current narrative on homelessness is an extension of that narrative, right, that we were built on in this country. And so what has happened is that it has led to a binary of, of choices, false choices. One is um, you have to raid uh, encampments, destroy people's communities, trash their possessions, their, their IDs and their um, medicines, or people, you, you allow people to live in squalor, right? Mm -hmm. The reality is that that doesn't work for anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's, no, this is not working for anyone, right? People shouldn't have to walk over feces and needles and walk over humans, and humans shouldn't be forced to live and pushed onto living in the street, full stop, right? So current narrative does several things. One is that people believe, and because of that, it leads to narratives that one, people believe you can't solve homelessness. Two, homelessness is just an extension, a fact of modern American life. Uh, and three, that if you are homeless, right, or experiencing homelessness, you um, have made you know a bad a bad choice, and that has real implications, right? Real real world implications. We don't have to look so far as last month when there was this huge national tragedy with Jordan Neely, and Jordan Neely was a young homeless man who was killed by someone who thought it was okay to choke and kill him. And he thought it was okay because he was having a mental health crisis on a New York City train. And so that the public discourse of fear and othering, that has real world implications. So that's a lot of the work that we're doing is to help shift that mindset using the neuroscience and cognitive behavior and narrative research that we'll get into in a little while. But, but really the, the piece of the narratives is really at the end harmful for both the people living it and harmful for the people that are in the neighborhoods. And so we have to both acknowledge the realities on the ground for everyone. Mark, let's, um, building on what Marisol just said and her experience of the narrative that she's working to change, you have a take that's um, similar and obviously uh, yeah, very yeah. your we're, own. But we're in a crisis. They, this is titled Urgency. Yes. And it's urgent. How many of you are aware of the Cicero Institute? And I have to preface this. This is like James Bond villain stuff. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But there's a, for -pro a, a billionaire that invests in for-profit prisons that started the Cicero Institute that's pushing template laws across the country. It is now a felony to be homeless in Tennessee. They are winning. And on top of that, these harmful narratives have been reinforced for decades. And now you have social media, people are frustrated, they're sharing online. You have right-wing funders and propaganda machines that are just spreading this false narrative. You, I mean, it is just growing and growing. And the worst part about it is the politicians and they're using it, they've weaponized criminalization to pander for votes. And we're not just talking Republicans, we're talking Democrats, and at all levels, national, local, state. And I, I'm going to read just a piece of an email that was sent out by Diane Yentl, who is the CEO and president of the Low Income Housing Coalition. And I am reading it because she says in a, paragraph what I wish I could say much more eloquently and if it's coming from somebody that is an expert and not me to validate this and she starts off the email saying in her 25 years of doing this she's never seen it bad this bad she said amidst the worsening rhetoric and intensifying affordable housing and homelessness crisis too many of our political leaders shun evidence-based solutions and instead approach uh, approaches to homelessness that were proven decades ago to be ineffective. 
Rather than addressing the structural inequalities causing homelessness, many politicians from both parties and all levels provoke anger among their constituents by wrongly conflating homelessness with crime or blaming individual characteristics instead of the systemic failing. They spend limited public resources on sweeping homeless encampments, leaving residents more isolated than before, rather than using these resources to ensure that unhoused people have access to what they need most, stable, accessible, affordable homes, blah, 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 very important. I mean, Trump, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, nationally said, we need to put people into camps, force them into camps. And if they don't go, we're going to arrest them. And that is the growing popular narrative. People are scared of homelessness. COVID caused a lot of it. It's more visible. And it is a urgent crisis. And we're losing this battle. So let's, let's um, not get depressed on that note. But take the urgency seriously. Because you're exactly right, we're in a in a struggle over which will be the dominant narrative that will shape the future of policy in the country and how we see the world. So Marisol, let's talk for a moment about how you're working to shift mm -hmm. that narrative, and Mark will come back to you on that. Yes, and I just want to add one thing to, to what Mark was uh, saying in your, your point, Grant. One of the things that we need to also think about is the idea that we need to be able to show people what is the solution, what is the North Star. We have to give people like something that we're working toward, that everyone have a safe place to call home, and show them how right now where we are. And we need to marry these two and work with them together. We're not doing that yet, right? And so, so a few things. One is uh, a little bit about the lab. We actually were started uh, as the brainchild of the Melville Charitable Trust. And uh, Susan Thomas, the president, saw a real need in the housing field for, um, for grassroots groups and advocates and service providers to shape a new narrative, a different narrative about uh, housing security and homelessness and, and the solutions for it. And so that was sort of our origin, our origin story. And you know, for us, and the first thing I'll say is that there are a lot of ways to shift narrative, and it is Everyone, our motto is everyone, everywhere, all the time. It's all of us in this room, it's all of us on the stage, it's all of us. So there are a lot of different ways, of you, as you've seen from the, the, all of the panels and discussions today, to start to move this needle. At the lab, it looks like uh, four things. Excuse me, I use my hands a lot. Um, at the lab, it looks like four, it, it's four ways that we approach this work. One is narrative research. So very, all of our work is evidence-based. We are looking at what are perceptions that people have, the attitudes that they hold, the values that they hold, so that we can start to see how do we talk with them about housing insecurity and homelessness and start to um, shift their thinking. So one is narrative research both at the national level and local level. We're working in Oklahoma. Uh, in Nebraska, Minnesota, and some places that are um, more in the middle of the country, uh, along with, with obviously the coasts. Uh, the second, and we're going to uh, show you a video shortly um, that is an example of the kind of work that we're doing uh, and the messages that we're, that we're finding. Um, the second is around training. So we do a lot of training and education about narrative. What is narrative? How to use narrative. Right? So we really work with everyone in the housing field from grassroots groups. Really important because the groups that we work with are in under-resourced communities. They are predominantly black and brown communities where access and capacity to all things in narrative doesn't exist. Right, They don't have the access to it. They don't have the capacity to do it. So the work that we are doing is to help them do that work. Right, Because they are working in the communities that we all know are disproportionately impacted by the issues that folks are facing with housing. Um, the second is strategic communications and support. Again, think of us as like the folks who train you for the marathon, and then we run the marathon with you, right? So that we're helping you kind of walk, go through the entire process together. And then um, the last piece is co coalition building and collaboration. 
when I talked about everyone everywhere all the time, that is the way we can start to shift a narrative. It requires scale, consistency, and repetition. And so we work with groups like uh, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, right? National groups that are influencers. We work with funders together to end homelessness. They're a group that's similar to um, Media Impact Forum is a, a philanthropy service organization and realized very early, right, that that narrative was going to be really key in helping to solve homelessness. And so for us, those are the four areas, right? So we kind of just look through the kind of loop um, in which we're engaging in this. So do you want to take a quick look at the yeah, clip Yeah, please, now? if we can um, show you the clip. So the clip that we're going to show you is called Forced Into Homelessness. And that's a clip, that, um, that is a message, excuse me, that we found in our research speaks to what we call persuadables. And persuadables are the broad middle, but they are specifically people that hold two opposing thoughts, as many of us do. One is they believe that housing is a basic need and people should have a home. And they believe that if you are experiencing homelessness, you've made a bad choice. And so this particular message we found was um, particularly effective at helping them move the needle a little bit. We asked them first, and then we first a series of questions, showed them the video, asked them a series of questions later, and we saw that this message in particular had, it, had an effect to help them start to think more about systemic uh, causes to homelessness. So let's see if we can go to that. Go to tape. Some people see things simply like homelessness is only a personal choice. And they say our government, who works for us, has no role in fixing it. But most of us know homelessness is not an American value because no matter what we look like, every person deserves a safe, quality, and affordable place to live. And there are proven, evidence-based strategies for how we deliver so everyone in our community has shelter. Lovely. Just really quickly on that video, so this is where the cognitive science is gonna come in, i nerd out it with you a little bit. The opening line of that message was, some people see things simply. So I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will be someone who says, I don't see things simply. So cognitively, that opening line stops you for a second. And it is just enough for you to like not shut me down that then we can continue the conversation. And that's where a lot of the neuroscience and cognitive research that you were talking about earlier really comes into play and is really important. So I love the fact that you start in research and get to the messaging through that. Um, you, sir, have gotten to your messaging also through experience and just listening to stories. So Mark, tell us about your invisible people and, and what you're trying to do. So invisible people started in 2008 with me traveling around, basically empowering homeless people to share their own story. There's many different reasons for that. We have now morphed into a nonprofit media publisher. We do daily journalism on homelessness, which is a miracle. I spell neighbor, N-A-B-O-R. So for me to be a news publisher is just a miracle in itself and uh, we do documentary films we do scripted films we do animations we also do research uh, what makes our work a little different is we always come from the lens of lived experience we focus on audience building and we focus on current media we reach conservatively 20 million plus a month um, and uh, let's look at one of our mini docs. What we do is by going the YouTube route, we have a million subscribers on YouTube, we have a built-in audience, we cut production costs, we cut production time, and the people that need to see it are gonna see it. Great, let's go to that. I don't know what I would do if mine would be got towed. Without it, I think, I genuinely don't even wanna think about what I would do. Because it, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Be out on the streets in the tent. Again, yeah. Just restarting again. They've been coming hard and strong, taking everything. We don't want to be out here, you know. We're trying to do the best we can. It's pretty difficult when they don't give us very much notice. It's pretty devastating because people are losing everything that they own when they don't own much to begin with, so. 
30 to 50 percent of people who are unsheltered in Seattle live in vehicles. That can be anywhere between 3,000 to potentially up to 5,000 people. It's hard to say because like most point in time counts, they're a bare minimum estimate. Uh, many cities like Seattle have regulations that push vehicles that are oversized, such as RVs, into industrial zones, which are often very far from where social services are located. So there's a really systemic disconnection between many people who are living in vehicles and the actual social service systems. So outreach that can come to people who are living in vehicles is essential for keeping people connected to housing navigation, social services, and medical care. A lot of different things. I wish I could play you journalism. We're currently working on a TikTok news show. It'll be up next time. I will be able to play you some of that. But, you know, traditionally, we've gone in the long form documentary as a sector. And homelessness is a hard topic. People are not going to sit through 45 minutes or an hour. And mostly people that have an affinity for homelessness go to a long form doc by being more accessible on, you know, TikTok or Instagram. Uh, more people see it. But I'm really excited about what I call a Trojan horse strategy. So please play the animation. A high school student can handle a more detailed discussion about the lack of affordable housing and the challenges of finding a job if you don't have a car or have kids at home to take care of. And don't shy away from core issues like poverty and racism. Homelessness is complicated, but your teen can handle it. If your child is six years old or younger, you're probably going to hear why a lot when you're explaining to a younger child. Hang in there and take it step by step. Why don't they have a bed to sleep in? When we go to the store, we have to pay for things with money. Some people don't have enough money to pay for things like a bed. Why? Well, they might be too sick to have a job and they might not have a family to help them. Why can't we help them? We can. We can give them food and water. We can say hello. They are our neighbors too, and we should be kind to our neighbors. If the whys keep coming, and you know they will, just be honest. Kids are curious, and that's a good thing. Take a moment to gently let them know that they are safe, even though others might be struggling. And then be as open as you feel is appropriate about what they see. What I mean by Trojan horse is we take tough conversations but package them in a way to reach a different audience. So that's really targeted to adults, but it's how to talk to your kids about homelessness. And you can find, I'm big on forward slash, invisiblepeople.tv forward slash animations, forward slash films, forward slash doc, forward slash news. You can find us, we do a We're gonna lot be here a while. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. I, um, you know, I'm struck by, as, as I see those, and, and um, as I was watching your clip, Marisol, you know, that old dictum that it's hard to hate somebody who you've gotten, whose story you've gotten to know, um, I think we intu intuitively believe. Something, I don't know if anybody else had this uh, reaction when McCleet was performing, but um, that was the most profound reframing of migration that I've seen in a long time by, by suggesting that, you know, in this world of issues and problems and challenges that we all tend to deal with, you could view that as having a soundtrack um, and that it's, there's this beautiful essence emerging in it. I, I mean, talk about something that would reframe how we see um, and how we get to know people. So, but, but does it work? You know, everybody in here has to think about reporting to awful folks like me who ask, what's the impact of this? And, and how do we know if it's working? And, and so what's the, how do you think about impact? Do you want to start, Mark? Sure, sure. So yesterday, I'm walking on Market Street, and I'm going to try to tell this really fast. And I turn a corner, and there's Brian. And I might cry. Brian and I were in a homeless shelter 28 years ago, and he's still homeless. And the only impact in the work we do that really means anything is solving homelessness. It really, really does. And so much we all need to rethink impact. Because the right wing media funders, the right wing people that are pushing out the propaganda, Joe Rogan is not looking at impact when he tells his millions of people to shoot homeless people. Dr. Drew is not looking at impact when he tells his millions of people that the housing crisis is a hoax. 
the countless amount of social media that was just shared showing homeless people in a negative light while I said that sentence. Broadcast news amplifying that social media. They are not looking at impact. They're looking at marketing metrics, but they're not looking at this impact. And, you know, like Prager University is putting out 50 videos a week targeted to youth that are, you know, really changing our future in a negative way. And we have to start thinking like that. Marisol. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, Mark. And um, I think impact is important in that for us, we think about impact um, around how people think. And that's a hard one to measure, right? Is how are we shifting how people think, their mindsets, their perceptions? Um, and it can be done, but guess what? It's not going to happen in one cycle. It's not going to happen in a three to five year cycle. Think about things like smoking in this country. Right? How long did it take to get from where we used to be in smoking to where we are right now? Marriage equality, seat belts. I saw a video from the 80s where this man was like, I can't believe they're going to make me put on a seat belt. I just want to go after work, have a few beers, and then drive home. <laughs> That's from the 80s, folks, right? And like, we put on a seatbelt for everything now, even in the back seat. I grew up at a time when we didn't put on in the back seat, right? So it takes a little, it takes a minute, right? And so for us, we look at a few things. Uh, you know, there are a few indicators, there are indicators, I should say, that can help you uh, and to see whether or not or how we are moving the needle. Um, for us, it's the narrative research, right? Really looking at and testing perceptions and how people are thinking about this. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that we work a lot with journalists. We do a lot of training with journalists. We do a lot of webinars with journalists. We do a lot of work with journalists. And so we're doing a lot of, we've done a social listening analysis of how journalists are talking about homelessness. And then we will be following that up to see how that's maybe moved, particularly as we keep doing more of these um, these trainings and webinars with journalists because we want them to go from telling the individual story to actually tying those stories because we know that storytelling is so key, but tying it to the systemic causes that are pushing people into the conditions that they're actually in. And then the second or the, the final piece of that that I will add is also looking at um, our partners' work. So our partners at CZI, they do a lot of media analysis in California. So looking at the narratives that are being told by the media in California, and they're doing that over time, looking at that over time. Or our partners at the Frameworks Institute, that they do a pop survey, um, a pop culture survey that looks at, again, perceptions like how do people think about personal responsibility versus systemic causes when people are facing hardship and poverty. Uh, and the most recent one, if you get a chance to take a look at it, showed actually a dip in personal responsibility and a slight increase in systemic. So that's all good news for us. So some indicators that, Mark, is, uh, is, you're so right on this, and there are some indicators that I think can help us, can help guide our way. So we've run out of time, but I just want to say thank you so much and just point out that what you have illustrated is we are in a critical moment and it's important to change these narratives. There's a methodology and a science for how to do that, and there's also an art, and there's an incredible beauty in how you're approaching it. And I just wanna say thank you on behalf of America that you are working to change these narratives the way that you are, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Grant, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to bring on Devin Gray and Jacob Kornbluth to um, talk with us about a similar conversation um, around poverty and yet another area where uh, there is an ongoing effort to entrench and deepen attitudes about, in a very negative way, about people who are poor or to borrow Mark's term, to uh, make them invisible. And, these two folks are working to change that and to connect narrative change with policy making. Let's dive into this discussion by talking first, Devin, about EPIC and what, it, what the organization is and what you're trying to accomplish. 
Uh, thanks, Grant. So End Poverty in California, uh, the mission's built into the name. It's very on the nose what we're trying to do here. And, uh, <laughs> and it's also very bold. Thank right? you for yeah. using a real name. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Um, and we were founded just last February by former Stockton Mayor Michael Tubbs, who maybe some of you are familiar with for uh, while he was mayor in Stockton, having the first guaranteed income pilot, which is now uh, turned into a movement around or 100 cities around the country have instilled their own guaranteed income pilots. So that's sort of his legacy from his mayorship there. And then our organization was founded last February. Uh, our work essentially exists in three big buckets. The first is the sort of traditional policy advocacy that exists in Sacramento, where we're pushing for policies that uh, include housing justice, uh, criminal justice, benefits access reform to make the safety net more inclusive and accessible, uh, small business and entrepreneurship, and labor support. Uh, the second related bucket of work has to do with local power building, particularly uh, grassroots organizing in the Central Valley. And then third, and perhaps most important in the topic of our discussion here, is our narrative change and storytelling work. And I think we realized quite early on in our work that the narratives that exist around poverty and explain why poverty persists and why it exists, why some folks live in poverty while others don't, uh, has been really detrimental towards the progress of policy advocacy around poverty issues, particularly in a state with, like California that has so much political capital among folks who ostensibly should be committed towards abolishing poverty. So these narratives that we talk about, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with them. You know, we've been dealing with them for centuries, um, probably you know, 400 years now at least in, in, in North America. I think there's sort of three main ones that are, are worth discussing. The first is we've been told that poverty is fundamentally an individual failing, that people are poor because they choose to be, because they're lazy, because they're addicted to drugs, or any number of other really harmful stereotypes and tropes. The second is that people who live in poverty are fundamentally untrustworthy, that you can't trust them with the resources in the same way that you could trust everyone else in society. And then the third is that poverty is an inevitability, that it is as much a part of the world as the air or the water that we can always expect it to exist in society. And the narrative that we're trying to shift to is one that says poverty is not an individual failing, but fundamentally a consequence of systems and policies that set people up to fail. Second, that people in poverty can be trusted if you give them money, which we've seen uh, demonstrated through the countless guaranteed income pilots around the country. Mm -hmm. And last, that poverty isn't inevitable, that in a state with the fourth largest economy in the world, with more billionaires in California than any country in the world aside from the United States and China, poverty existing as it does is ultimately a policy choice and a, and a deliberate one at that because we have the resources to be able to eradicate it here. So um, we realized that the narrative work is going to be really important for us and it's why we decided to invest in it very early with both staff and bringing on Jake to help us uh, do a lot of film work and video work. So really happy that he's on our team um, and I think we're able to do some good work. Great. Jacob, tell us a little bit about what your role is in this. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, I got my start in this kind of work. Uh, first, I made a film called Inequality for All, and then I started a nonprofit called Inequality Media that was all about storytelling around the issue of widening economic inequality. And um, I was, I, I loved that work, but it felt like we were always not able to directly affect policy. And what was so unique about Epic and why I was so excited to get involved with this work was we had an opportunity to blend, um, I think, high level narrative change work with uh, policy change in the same org. So often when you're a storyteller, you don't feel like you're in the same room with policymakers. I was at some breakout session earlier where um, uh, an artist was up there saying every, an artist should be in every newsroom to kind of help shape this. And in some way, I've always believed that we've been left out of the policy discussions till the end. Everybody's got everything cooked, and now we're going to try to make a video and see if we can package it together. And Epic invested from the ground up in narrative change right along with the, um, the policy work, and that seems pretty important and, 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 and meaningful to me. So uh, that's what we set out to do. I think we're still on the journey to see how it works. Well, and Devin, you've already spoken a bit to the narratives that you want to shift, uh, but I'm, I'm curious to hear more about who you think is, this is not a static landscape. Sure. Yeah. And, and part of what you're up against, similar to the panel before, is that there, um, there are forces that would like us to believe that it is a personal failing yeah. and that, um, and find it convenient to, to or, or they believe it, to push that agenda. 
Uh, why is storytelling important? In, uh, if you're trying to shift policy, yeah. why would you begin with something that once upon a time, people in the policy arena would have dismissed as irrelevant? Yeah, I think it's because ultimately those stories are really impactful in the ways that not, we, not only how we decide what to prioritize mm -hmm. in our policies, but also how we design them too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the root of these harmful narratives, to, to get to your question, it's all based in not being able to see yourself and other people fundamentally. There's like a disconnect of humanity, I think, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways um, that makes the narratives so harmful and sort of spiritually damaging in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, and not just offensive, but like in the way that they actually manifest in the policy decision. So for example, when we talk about benefits access reform and thinking about how we can make our safety net more inclusive for folks, you realize that built into the actual fabric of the policies are the stories that we've been told about people in poverty in the first place. So there is a presumption that has been um, told to us for you know, many decades now that people who are trying to access the systems are fraudulent until proven otherwise. Uh, and the way that that manifests is through like work requirements and onerous forms and constant recertification. So the reason why the stories are so important is because the stories are actually at the foundation of the policies. Yeah. Like we take the policies and then we build the, po we take the stories and we build the policies around them as opposed to vice versa, which I think many, many people assume when they get into this work. So the stories, we have to start with the stories because the policies start with the stories. Right. And I just wanna draw a bright box around your use of the word spiritual mm -hmm. um, a moment ago, because I think so much so often when we have this conversation, what gets lost is the fact that many of these negative narratives that you're combating mm -hmm. are actually corrosive for the country. Yes. They, they produce a meaner, more mean-spirited, less uh, a country that has less potential actually to make ch the sort of change that we imagine. Mm -hmm. And it's brave to talk about that. I think you know, it's easy, um, easier to talk about policy than yeah. it is about that. So thank you for bringing that up. So what does it look like when you're thinking about telling us a different story about poverty? Uh, it certainly can't be a one and done. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, there is a systemic approach I remember thinking about uh, with, again, a long time ago with Inequality for All, where feature documentaries reach thought leaders. We know that the audience that used to go to theaters and watch films was um, usually educated and had some money to go spend mm. <laughs> the time watching something like a documentary. And that felt like it was an important piece to the puzzle. But there's the short form stuff, this is where the audience, they weren't reaching the people I wanted the films to reach. Mm. So those people were on social media. So the real secret, I think, and we, these, we've had the dialogue to build this from the ground up, was to build the short form content that reaches the audience directly where they are exactly as they consume that content with this kind of long form, uh, you know, stuff that we hope reaches the thought leaders and the grass tops groups that sort of help design the policies and those kinds of things. So we created a uh, 50 minute film that will be out very soon in the summer. I think we have a trailer for it. Can we show it now? Is that okay? Absolutely not. Oh, yeah, man. yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. But uh, this is for the film that's coming out. Politicians give speeches all the time and no one talks about poverty. I'm undocumented, I'm an undocumented mother at that and I feel like there's not very many resources out here for me. The kind of debt you accrue in poverty with no access to capital or credit keeps you in this kind of perpetual state of poverty. Let's talk about being incarcerated working, making seven cents an hour. A lot of us is not hip to the historic ways of oppressing us, especially on the southwest side, like the red lighting and eminent domain. There are 800 evictions in the pipeline in East County alone. If you're spending more time at galas and chicken dinners than you are walking the neighborhood, then you're doing this job wrong. The reality here, people want a way to survive, and it's just, it's hard. Me being poor and me being a poor person in a poor neighborhood, I'm not gonna be heard. You can't really talk about poverty from on high. You have to really get down with the folks. Policy decisions will help them to get resources. A concrete system in place, not just words. How policy is ran in California, they're gonna have to change eventually. It's just gonna have to, somebody gonna have to spark that change. We're not asking for anything more than what is our God-given right. I'm here to say that we've had enough. We stand with you. Because when we fight, we win. When 
win. We fight. You cannot police poverty. Sadly, most small businesses can't afford to provide health care. Well-researched policies from baby bonds to guaranteed income to housing as a right. We're not to take advantage of the system, but to chase the American dream. It's like really hard when your kids are hungry. Thank you. Uh, so, so that'll come out in the summer, hopefully be, to be shown all over the state as part of uh, this discussion around changing uh, policy. And then we're creating something like 50 to 70 social media assets that will be released daily and sort of uh, be in short bits reach audiences right where they are. And this has been a dream of mine for a long time. And, and this organization has you know, embraced this approach to kind of do this short form with the long form content in one Well, and so let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the longer form looks like. And you know, Devin and I were talking about this um, earlier, and you know, we were we were both reflecting that there have been, you know, every every piece of art and every piece of journalism and every act of storytelling in this space <laughs> contributes something and has value. Um, but there have been a lot of documentaries produced explaining these issues. And what makes this different? What is the, what's different about this approach? This is what keeps Devin up at it night. Is, it is, <laughs> so I was telling Grant that. Yeah, yeah I, I think what we wanted to make sure we weren't doing with this was have it be like one flash in the pan of like a really good product that never saw the light of day again, was just collecting dust after it came out. So what we're hoping to do is use this film as an organizing tool and to be able to take it around the state as Jake was talking about, but use it, uh, work with community organizations up and down California uh, to say you can have a screening of this with a discussion guide and a curriculum that comes with it that we're producing as well. So the goal is that this has a little bit more of a longer shelf life uh, beyond just one screening for folks. Yeah, and, and you know, every, as a you know, creator, every piece of content you have to listen to the story and see how the form meets the function best. In this particular case, we're connecting lived experiences of people ex experiencing poverty with the halls of power. Michael Tubbs, who's, who founded End Poverty in California, is a unique presence in his connection of those two uh, elements. Often people who are living in poverty don't feel like they have the ability mm -hmm. to reach those halls of power where people are making policy and debating policy. And those people in policy have virtually no interaction with people who are experiencing poverty. And that's a lot of the problem. So what we tried to do in this film without beating you over the head with the uh, ideological sledgehammer is show you that experience of bringing the voices living in poverty to the halls of power. Hopefully that's an empowering experience for people who see it and give voice to the folks who are actually experiencing this stuff to kind of, I guess, you know, show that they should be a part of the policy discussion in some way. That, you know, frankly, you know, every story about poverty or any of these issues should find some way to take all these negative issues and turn them into something that, that feels motivating and empowering in some way. Um, I sometimes resist the direct calls to action, but you do want to feel like you empower people mm -hmm. in some way with this content because stories do have the power to motivate if they're, if they're presented in that way. So Marisol was, um, was talking with me earlier before our panel, and this is one of the problems with these things is that we, we have more interesting conversations also off stage, <laughs> um, but the, but she was sharing that um, as they do their research, the issues uh, that emerge in places uh, like uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska are obviously different than in Minneapolis. And issues around race and personal responsibility play differently in the housing space depending on where you are in the country. Um, and that's one of the reasons that they test the messaging that they do. Are you viewing this as a work of art, or have you, are you viewing this as a social act that requires that kind of research? Well, I, I think this, this does speak to something we were yeah. speaking about uh, off camera, which is um, the difference between journalism and storytelling in a certain way is, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was uh, pulled aside by my parents and said, you know, you should not go into storytelling even though I wanted to. And I had to answer that question about was this going to be my job. Everybody who was a journalist had a different question that they had to answer with their parents about are you going to ever try to make a living. But, you know, as a, as a 
person who believed in story first. I believe that art is my primary lens to see the world through. But I believe that that has, I started out in comedy as we discussed and I, I've made narrative dramas in films that have played at Sundance and what I believed is that lens is incredibly helpful to the issue driven space where a lot of times people nod their heads and agree but can't take in the information because it feels too heavy. I feel like the storytelling helps that. So my lens as a storyteller artist to the issues is, is useful. I love my primary community as friends are advocates and I think everybody, they see often see the world through a moral lens and I feel like um, it's hard to kind of reach people who don't have that same moral drive without feeling frustrated with them. And the way that I think that I've seen it is storytelling helps that. It helps to communicate past the people who got into advocacy work from a, a kind of moral need to people who they get frustrated with in a way by not having that same drive. But anyway, I don't know if that speaks directly to it, but it's a, it's a good answer. Yeah, yeah I, I think, Grant, to your point about the, the conversation of having different conversations in Minneapolis versus Tulsa versus you know, other places around the country, I mean, I think we have to think about that a lot in California, which is, of course, a state of tremendous diversity. And realizing that the messages that we tell are going to look very different to different audiences, potentially. Um, but at the heart of it is, how do we meet people where they are? And how do we try to instill that shared sense of humanity that allows people to see themselves in someone who might be in a different set of circumstances? Uh, hopefully with someone to be able to say, you know, but for the grace of God go I, that I'm not in their shoes where I would probably be making the same kinds of decisions and have the same kinds of challenges that they do. Uh, because again, I think that disconnect of being able to see yourself in someone else um, is what fuels these narratives, right? So I think it's a real challenge in a state as diverse as ours, but at the same time, if we can't do it here in a place where we like have all the wealth and have all the brilliance and intellectual capital and have all the political capital, it's gonna be really hard to make that case in a place like, uh, I don't know, um, Nebraska or, or Oklahoma where I know Marisol's doing work. So um, all that's to say is we, we give that a lot of thought around just the, you know, we have 40 million people here and Northern California looks a lot different than Southern California and inland versus coastal and all of the different ways you can chop and divide the state. But it's a challenge, but it's one that I think is really important for us to get a hold of. Well, as you, um, as you think about the moment that we're in and that you're, you're doing this work, you heard Mark earlier in the, in the previous panel uh, issue his own personal plea for urgency. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what makes Given that this issue has been um, has been the subject of conversation for centuries and millennia and decades in this country, and we continue to evolve our understanding about it, what makes it urgent right now? Yeah. I think it's a uniquely perverse situation right now, just given the amount of inequality that we have. I mean, folks may not know this, but California, when you take into account cost of living, has one of, if not the highest, rates of poverty in the entire country. And we say that all while having you know, this massive economy with all of this wealth. Um, I think the call to action, the urgency is that, my hope is that as we continue doing this work, we internalize the belief that poverty isn't inevitable. It's what I was mentioning before. Like we've really clung onto this idea that because poverty has always existed, it will always exist. And I think that we can probably think of examples in history where that's just not the case. Uh, we don't have to live in a state where so many have so little while so few have so much. So yeah, I think that's the, that's the call to action is we have to change our paradigm. We have to change what we think is possible because we know that we have the tools. So I think that's what I would leave folks with. What about you? Yeah, well, you know, you, we live in the richest state and the richest yeah. country in the history of the world. And we have the highest rate of poverty in that same place. Um, if that isn't a call to action, I don't know what is. I think there's this question of, um, social cohesion that's all over the place. And this, this thing of if you can't talk about poverty, I don't know how you address these, all of the questions that, we care, that I think we all care about across issues. And what's been so fascinating about the poverty issue, so many of us who are frustrated with what happens policy-wise um, think that this narrative discussion is adjacent rather than central to it. And if you look at the poverty story, you see programs targeted to the middle class that people don't even experience as programs. And then you see these poverty programs that are so punitive yeah. in the way that they're handled. And you're like, well, why is that? There's no reason except 
for the story. So you have this unbelievable situation we live in that we're, we're now almost immune to, and you have this group that's in th this, this sort of subject that's almost impossible to talk about, to get anybody to talk about poverty. Everybody wants to deal with poverty. Nobody has any thoughts about it. And now you have this narrative meets um, uh, policy change opportunity. It felt like something that, that was you know, exactly of the moment and of the time. And it felt like it spoke to everything that I had been, um, you know, personally anyway, thinking about for the last 10 years. It felt like a real opportunity in that respect. As far as like why poverty now, I think just the, the sense of like, if we can't do it in California, it's hard to see a way out. I think we have to start here, as Devin, just to build on what you were saying. I think you got to start here, and if you can't do it with all supermajority of Democrats across all the legislatures and the governor's office, all the wealth, all the inequality in this place, if you can't tackle this here, then what? Then what do we do? How do we say we're going to fix it on a national level? How do we say we're going to fix it in Georgia or you know any of the other more conservative parts of the country? If you can't start here, I feel like. We have to answer that question right here, right now. Yeah. I kind of almost want to end there, but I got to use three minutes. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's go, please. Let's yes. dig in. So yeah. I, I just, um, I would add one more, which is just to, I, I think what both of you said is beautiful, um, but I want to tie it to conversations from this morning about democracy. And I, I think we are in a, re a moment of reset as a country, for good or bad. Something different is going to emerge in the next 10 years in the United States than many of us had in mind or grew up with, yeah. period. It's going to be different. And um, maybe part of that is going to be a reinvented democracy. And that will either be one that operates on punitive principles or it will be one that looks at things like housing as a human right, doesn't accept that somebody should be on the streets uh, for 30 years and looks at poverty as something that should be solved and not just accepted. So I just want to say bravo to you uh, for, for doing that work. However, um, your point about uh, have to solve, if, if we can't do it here, we can't do it anywhere. OK, high stakes. Now California's on the hook. That's but right. um, this narrative needs to be happening all over the country almost at the same time. So to folks who are not doing this work in California, what's your advice to them about how this uh, show could be taken on the road and how to reach people elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of what I was saying a little bit earlier. We have to meet people where we are, where they are. Um, not the same types of narratives that work here are going to work everywhere, and that's okay. Um, and if, in fact, I would argue that in places where the policy advances are actually harder to come by, the narrative work might even be more important because it's kind of the only way that we can get the ball rolling in the first place. So with that, you know, if you're not able to get, you know, even just like an expanded child tax credit or whatever the, the form might be in a given state, you can at least try to tell a story that allows people within a given community to see themselves in each other. And obviously, you know, that's gonna take different forms, different places. It's gonna be perhaps along racial lines or religious lines or whatever it might be, but I think the stories need to be told in a way that resonates with people and resonates in an ability for them to say, you know, this person actually has more in common with me than maybe I thought. Yeah, there's this great quote that, uh, that Michael Tubbs is fond of, which is, uh, talent is broadly distributed, but resources are not. And there's this opportunity to think about uh, the possibilities of economic possibilities that we are losing mm -hmm. by not sort of elevating the folks uh, by not giving a chance, basically, to everybody. This sort of the myth of the meritocracy, tap into it, use it. And I feel like that's a really powerful framing across the country about how to, how to framing. By the way, framing and narrative, we can get into this. I, I, I don't like it when those things are conflated too much. But I do like the idea that we try to find a way for, to empower folks who are not in this for moral reasons. And that could be a good way to think about it, that there's um, across the country an opportunity to unleash talents to make America a more innovative and interesting dynamic economic place that we are losing by not having policies in place to, uh, to actualize some of these other things. So I'm fond of that. I, I love that. And I just want to say for the, um, for the benefit of this group, I want to thank everyone in this room who's working on these issues. Um, because I think this is the work of the next 
30 to 40 years. Uh, and in our work, what we have come to believe is that so many of the breakdowns that we're experiencing as a culture, politically, in terms of civic discourse, and in terms of mental health and social cohesion, what Vivek Murthy has referred to as the crisis of loneliness, is really at root a crisis of belonging. And that is ultimately a failure to see each other as human beings and to learn how to connect with each other. What our panelists have been talking about today is not an esoteric notion of shifting narratives. It's actually building that cohesion back into how we regard each other as human beings and to use your word, empathy. Thank you.